Hey, welcome everybody. It's Tom Hughes from Christian Assembly Church, and I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us this weekend for our online worship service. I want to let you know that our staff is available. Um, you can reach out to them, find them at our website, cachurch.com, and you can email and they will reach out, pray with you, encourage you, or hear what's going on in your life. Also, for prayer requests, you can also use the uh, CA app as well as the email address that will be on your screen. A few other announcements I need to just let you know before we get started. I want to thank all of you who call Christian Assembly home for your ongoing generosity and empowering all that we do by your giving back to God. A couple ways that you can do that. Of course, you can do online through our website. Uh, go to the click on the give tab and it'll walk you through the steps. You can use our Christian Assembly Los Angeles app that is downloadable from any smartphone store app store. And then also uh, you can mail your uh, offerings back to God um, by mailing us at Christian Assembly Church. And our mailing address is 2424 Colorado Boulevard, Los Angeles, California, 90041. I want to thank you for your ongoing generosity. And of course, as always, any visitors or guests feel no obligation to participate. For some of you, I believe God's going to use this time in this service to call you to make a decision to say yes to Jesus. And if that's you, we're going to be so excited to celebrate with you. You can just email us to let us know that you've made that decision at decision at cachurch.com and we will follow up with uh, you. Maybe you have a friend that you want to share with as well. You can share this uh, online service with them so that they too could hear the message. Of course, next weekend is our Easter celebration weekend at home. And so I want to encourage you to join us. We're going to have a great celebration with music and worship and a special Easter message. We'll also have our Kids Church Easter celebration experience as well online. On a personal note, I know maybe some of you, but not all of you have heard that my mom passed away this week. It was not related to the coronavirus. And yet that leaves me with a measure of grief nonetheless. I want to thank you for those of you that have been praying for me and my family during this time. Uh, so grateful that my mom knew the Lord and is with him now celebrating uh, with him. Also, just want to let you know that we uh, are going to be using some pre-recorded worship sets uh, this week. We had a family member of a team member who was possibly exposed to the coronavirus by working at a hospital. So out of abundance of precaution, we're using these pre-recorded sets. Now, the great thing about it, you're going to see in these pre-recorded sets that there's a bunch of people all around together. But don't worry, this was all before social distancing was in effect. And so you can worship without any concerns on that. In addition, the sermon that Matt is going to share is going to come from his home as well. When we come to the time of communion, the communion table is open to all who would say that you're a follower of Jesus. So you can get a piece of bread ready for that time. Well, let me pray now and we'll then move into our time of worship. So God, I pray now that you would meet with us as we worship you in this time. Be with us, we pray, on this Palm Sunday weekend. In Jesus' name, amen.
God's word, Jake. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all things together. Let's say it together. He reigns supreme. Him with many crowns, the Lamb upon His throne. Crown Him with many crowns, Jesus. Crown Him the Lord of love. Behold His hands and sides. Crown Him the Lord of love, Jesus. Let's take it up. For us, He's one, and for that glorious day when all our 
our work is Come on, people We'll kiss this world goodbye As we're flying high we will Giving the glory, giving the honor Oh, oh, oh Giving the glory, giving the Well, to my Christian Assembly family and to whoever's joining us, welcome to my living room. I assume you're at home and uh, I'm in my home, but I'm glad that we get to have this time together. I'd like to pray for us before I get into the message. Would you pause with me and join me in prayer? Well, Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you are with us. We're thankful for this chance to be together in this way. And God, thanks for a chance to pause, to worship, and to hear your word. I pray, Lord, that every person that's watching this, that's participating in this online service, that they would have a very real sense of your presence with them. I pray, God, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit and that they would know beyond any any doubt You are God, and you love us. I thank you for your love, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been in a series called Running with the Giants, and we're going to conclude that series today. Next weekend, Mark will be speaking to us with an Easter message, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, The message of this series about running with the giants has been anchored in the words of Hebrews chapter 12. It comes right after what is a kind of hall of fame or a who's who of Bible characters in chapter 11 and all of their examples of faith. And then in chapter 12, 
we read this. Therefore, since we are surrounded, even in these days of social distancing, you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Don't let anything keep you from living by faith and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And here's where we're going today fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. If you want to enter into life with God, if you want to live by faith and receive all that God has for you, there is one way to do that, and it is by following Jesus, the perfecter of our faith, the author and finisher of our faith. The race of life already has a champion. It's Jesus. And he's the kind of champion who, after receiving the prize, turns around and offers the prize to all who would cross the, fall, the finish line by following him. But what does it mean to follow Jesus? I hear a lot of people talk about Jesus as a great teacher and that we can learn to practice his teachings. Is that what it means to follow him? I hear a lot of people talk about Jesus as a, a leader of a, a new religion that he founded. Is, is being religious, is that what it means to follow Jesus? What, what does that mean? Here's what I've noticed in the Bible and in life. And maybe you've noticed the same thing, that Jesus has admirers and Jesus has followers. And there's a distinct difference between admiring Jesus and following Jesus. Here's the distinction. Admiration fades and fails to cross that finish line with Jesus. Followers follow through believing our hope is secured on the cross that Jesus has won our prize for us. So I want to try to show you this distinction today. And I want us to ask ourselves this question, which camp are you in these days? Are you living like an admirer of Jesus or are you following him? This distinction between admirers and followers is maybe never more clear than the difference between Palm Sunday and Good Friday. And so we're going to visit both of those scenes in Scripture. Palm Sunday looks like it could be Jesus' finest hour up to that point in the Gospels. He's come out of Nazareth. Everywhere Jesus goes, he shakes things up. The religious establishment of the time, they, they feel so threatened by Jesus that they're conspiring to kill him. He's a hero to some. He's a rebel to others. Some love him and some hate him. And now Jesus has arrived in the city of Jerusalem, the center of power and prominence of Israel. And he's arrived just in time for a festival. But already stories about Jesus have spread throughout the city. People have heard that he has performed miracles. They've heard that he calmed a storm, that he made food multiply, that he healed people. They've even heard that Jesus brought a dead man back to life. The story about Lazarus coming to, back to life and being called out of his grave, that story has spread like wildfire in Jerusalem. And one more thing, there are rumors 
that Jesus will defeat Rome and free Israel. That's the rumor. And if he can do it, if he's that kind of Messiah, then the Jewish people are ready to make him king and to join him in rebellion against Rome. And so I want you to listen to how John tells this Palm Sunday story in his gospel in chapter 12. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of palm trees. Now, that is a symbol of rebellion, of revolution. They took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him. And they began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as it is written. This is a prophecy that John is pointing out Jesus fulfilling in this moment. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And John tells us that these things the disciples didn't understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified after the resurrection, they looked back over the events they had been through with Jesus and they remembered these things about him. Verse 17, so the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, they kept talking about it. They didn't stop. Verse 18, for this reason also the people went and met him because they had heard Jesus had performed this sign, this miracle. Well, the Pharisees said to one another, these are the religious leaders, you see that you are not doing any good. They say, look, we're not getting anywhere. The world is running after this man. Verse 20, now there were some Greeks among those who were said uh, or who were going up to worship at the feast. And these Greeks, they came to Philip. Now, John, you got to understand, he's saying the Greeks, these guys were big shots. And Philip is a little guy from a small town, uh, Bethsaida of Galilee. And so these big shots have found little Philip. And they ask him, they say, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Verse 22 tells us that Philip ran and told Andrew. And then Andrew and Philip ran and told Jesus. They think this is great. They think Jesus is going global here. Verse 23, and Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Everyone is calling for him to be king. Uh, they want him to lead them in, in victory. But Jesus takes things here in a very different direction. Jesus says to Philip and Andrew, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. All of a sudden, Jesus is talking about dying. Verse 25, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Now I can imagine Philip and Andrew at this point looking at each other and thinking, does this mean he doesn't want to see those Greek guys? What's he talking about? But Jesus is experiencing all the fanfare of Palm Sunday on a whole different level because he knows where he's headed. Jesus knows that he did not come for a parade. He knows that the same people who are calling him king will soon be calling for his crucifixion. And in verse 37, John slows the action of the story down and tells us, 
what's really going on. Verse 37, But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. John is saying being a fan is not the same as believing. Admiring is not the same as following. Jesus came to call followers, not admirers. You won't cross the finish line with Jesus by admiring him from a seat in the stadium. Jesus was never impressed with spectators. Anyone who wants life with God knows that we don't need a celebrity to admire. We need a Savior to lead us all the way across the finish line. And so I want to point out admirers and followers, and I want you to see which camp are you living in these days. So let's look at the admirers in greater detail first. John says the Palm Sunday crowd thought they were running after a great man, an admirable man, a powerful man. People were standing in line, watching and waiting for this superstar to pass by. But John gives us this insight. Underneath all of their hosannas, they had no faith to speak of. And without faith, they didn't see Jesus for who he is. You ever been disappointed with a celebrity before? I'll never forget one time I bumped into Larry King in a bookstore. You remember Larry King, that interview show that he had where he'd sit at the table with his shoulders up high and the big microphone and those crazy suspenders? Well, I ran into him in a book a bookstore one day, and I couldn't help but introduce myself, just just meet Larry King, you know. Uh, but I can tell you that he was not at all interested in talking to me. <laughs> and not only that, but he didn't even have the suspenders on. It, it was so disappointing to meet Larry King at a bookstore. Uh, it wasn't really like meeting him at all. You see, admirers don't see the real thing. Admirers see what they want to see. And the crowd on Palm Sunday were going to make Jesus what they wanted him to be. Remember palm branches I told you were symbols of rebellion and revolution? Jesus never spoke about leading a rebellion. Jesus never spoke of military revolt. This is a total projection of who the admirers want and expect Jesus to be. Admirers of Jesus always project on Jesus what they want him to be and what they want him to do still happens today. People love to claim Jesus on their side. Jesus would vote Republican. Jesus would vote Democrat. Uh, Jesus has been used to argue for capitalism and for communism as if we had the power to make Jesus who and what we want him to be. When the admiring crowd saw that Jesus was arrested and beaten. Uh, he was no longer who they wanted him to be. When he was arrested and beaten, the admirers, uh, so disappointing. How, forget about him. In fact, you know what? Just crucify him. We have no more use for him. Because admirers can change on a dime or on a few pieces of silver. So they did what admirers do when disappointed. The crowd who had hailed Jesus as king now are calling for his execution. Crucify him. Pilate says, what did he do? What, what, what crime has he committed? Crucify him, they say. They saw no way for salvation 
to happen now. These admirers wanted the power to make Jesus king. And when they were disappointed, they wanted the power to crucify him. They didn't understand that he was more than a leader, more than a king. They didn't understand that he was offering more than freedom from Rome. He was offering freedom from our souls oppressed by sin. They didn't understand that he was offering more than peace with their enemies. He was offering peace with Almighty God. They saw a man they admired, but they didn't see the God they worshipped. To simply admire Jesus misses the point. Jesus didn't come to be a celebrity. He came to be a savior. He didn't come uh, to be admired. He came to make sinners free. He didn't come to fulfill our expectations. He came to fulfill God's expectations for all of us and to complete in perfection what we had wrecked with sin. Admiration fades before reaching the finish line. So let's look at followers. Followers follow through, believing that our hope was won on the cross. You have to follow him to receive what he offers you. Follow him when miracles are happening and follow him to the cross where God counted our sins against him instead of us. Follow when Jesus is celebrated as a king and follow when he's nailed to a cross as an offering. Lord, where you go, I will follow. A.W. Tozer once said, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And there's truth in that. But maybe even more important than what you think about God is what God thinks about you. What you think about God will have a great deal to do with how you live your life. But Jesus came so that we could know what God thinks about you and me and to show us God's love. In verse 43, John says of these, th that admiring crowd, he says, they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Followers realize that God does not need our approval. We need his approval. Approval uh, from Almighty God is perhaps the most important thing about who you are. Admirers live as though Jesus were on trial in the eyes of the world, but followers live knowing that the world is on trial before the eyes of God. You see, a follower will trust Jesus even when others disapprove. Like the old song that says, I've decided to follow Jesus. And I love that verse in the song that says, Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Admirers have a tendency to turn back in disappointment, but followers follow through, believing their hope was won on the cross. Admirers look at the cross and they see defeat, but followers look at the cross and they see hope. When it looks like all is lost, those who are following Jesus know that our Savior came to seek and to save what is lost. And what looks like defeat in a follower's eyes is just a setup for victory. Remember what they shouted at Jesus? Hosanna! Hosanna! They were quoting an Old Testament prophet. And I want you to hear the context of those words. 
These are words that a prophet named Zechariah heard God speak. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then in verse 11, Zechariah records the Lord saying, As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. The Lord says, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners. You used to be captives, captive to sin, captive to your appetite, captive to depression, captive to fear, captive to age, captive to anger, but he set you free. And then Zechariah records the Lord saying, return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. You prisoners of hope. I love that phrase. Strange phrase. Prisoners of hope. Captured by hope. Hope you can't get out of. Hope that, that won't let you go. Because the king on a cross has set you free by the covenant of his blood. I can't get out of the hope I have in Jesus. If the sun sets you free, you are free and you're free to hope. You can't get away from that hope. And when trouble comes, when things look bad, when circumstances are floundering in your life and, and it looks like defeat, look at the cross. Look at God's love for you declared on the cross. Look at the hope of our Savior won for you on the cross. The prize is already yours. Follow, follow, believe. You hope, your hope is secure. It's real, it's coming. He's saving you. What looks like a defeat on the cross is just the forgiveness of your sins and a whole new covenant way of life with God because Jesus has already won for you. Jesus came to free the captive and give hope to the hopeless. You are free to hope. Admirers turn their backs in disappointment, but followers keep believing and do not lose hope because what looks like defeat is just the beginning of victory. What looks dead is going to live. You were never, you were never destined for defeat. You were destined for life. You were destined for free life, hope-filled life, overcoming life. Jesus came to give you freedom to live with that kind of hope. And when you get it, when you get what Jesus came to do, when you get that he came for you to know God's gracious approval of us, when you get that Jesus came to set you free from whatever holds you back, when you get that, when you trust and believe that the king on the cross is your king, defeating sin and death for you, you can't help but hope with new hope. You can't help hoping in the face of despair. You can't help hoping with a hope that reaches beyond this world like an anchor tossed into eternity and held in the hands of Jesus. You can't help hope because of the cross Hope is the new world we can live in. It's a hope that won't disappoint because it's already been secured and won for you on the cross for the joy set before Jesus. He endured that cross. He did it for joy. Jesus rejoices because on the cross, he won the hope of all who follow him through the finish line. Jesus gave us a way to respond to him. He gave us a way to respond and to receive all that he has for us, to receive what he won for us on the cross. And that response is faith. 
And maybe you've never spoken to Jesus and spoken your faith to him and just prayed a prayer, a prayer and said, Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I want to receive all you have for me. I want the hope you won for me on the cross. I receive you and I trust you to be my savior. And if you've never prayed a prayer like that to Jesus, you can do that right now. You can just say, Jesus, I receive you and I believe in you. I'm trusting you. I'm putting my faith in you and I'm hoping, I'm hoping, will you lead me across the finish line? And I promise you, That kind of prayer, if you spoke that prayer, God heard you. That's that's the prayer God wants to answer in your life right now, today. And for all of those who believe, Jesus' invitation is come on and follow, and follow with hope, hope that cannot be found in this world, but hope that was won for us on the cross Jesus gave us another way to to receive uh, what he's done for us with faith, and that's what we call communion, uh, to receive his broken body and his shed blood for us. Communion is a way for us to remember that we needed a Savior. We needed Jesus to do what he did for us and to remember that we've received that salvation And so just in a moment, I'm going to invite you to take bread if you have some and eat it with me and and then take a cup. If you have a cup of juice with you, you can take that. And we're going to celebrate communion together in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and breaking it, he said, this is my body broken for you. And as often as you do this, remember me and remember what I've done for you. And then after the bread, he took the cup and raising it, he said, this is a cup of a new covenant in my blood. And as often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me, remembering our Savior. And so I invite you now to take Uh, some bread and eat it and take the cup and drink from it. My friend, he loves you. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross that his body might be broken for you and that his blood might be shed for you, that you might have salvation and hope of everlasting life with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's worship now. I want to find my hope in you. I want to find my hope in you. Not a hope this world claims to give. I want to find my hope in you. I want to find my joy in you I want to find my joy in you Not a joy this world claims to give I want to find my joy Hot 
heart wants more and more and more of you. Thank you for joining us in worship this weekend. To encourage you in your faith, I actually have written for you and your friends and family a Holy Week daily liturgy where you can follow through the footsteps of Jesus this week, all the way from Palm Sunday through Easter. That liturgy is available for you to use on our website at cachurch.com. You can download that PDF and follow each day. It's great for small groups, families, or even individuals to use. Also want to encourage you, of course, we have our daily touch points as well as our midweek Bible study happening on our social media accounts, and those are at CA Church LA. And of course, next weekend, join us for our Easter celebration services and encourage others to join us online for that as well. And now, may I leave you with this benediction. May the God who is able give you fresh peace and new strength and eternal hope this Holy Week and every week in Jesus' name. Amen.